Okay, so today I'd like to talk about The Speakable and Unspeakable in Quantum Mechanics by John Bell. I think it's John Stuart Bell, but I don't want to be too presumptuous, but I think that's where it goes. Uh, this is the second edition. This is one of these books that I had, and it disappeared, and um, I had to get a new one, and so I ended up with a second edition. So I had a I had one of these when I was an undergraduate, and then at some point I had to pick up this second edition, which is good because this one has this introduction by Elaine Espe, who um, really did a good job of using Bell's theorem, which shows up in this speakable and unspeakable in quantum mechanics. It, it shows up here and it um, fixes all that up. Um, so I think we're going to be pretty good with that. That's a, that's a good thing to have in here is somebody who actually provided the experimental proof of what John Bell was talking about. And since the experiment John Bell was talking about is so important to quantum foundations, it's really um, an important thing to get into your brain. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted one of the reasons why I thought about this, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this, is because um, some of the things in here, in fact, the pa exact papers in here, were talked about in that quantizing time conference I went to. Um, well, I virtually went to a couple of weeks ago, about three or four weeks ago. So I thought it would be good to bring a copy of this back home and talk about it a little bit. So. Again, this is a really um, interesting book because it is, I mean, it's just a collection of Bell's papers that have to do with uh, quantum philosophy, right? What he calls quantum philosophy. And, you know, Bell was working at CERN and all sorts of stuff like that, so it's very important to know about that. But basically, it's these 24 papers that we talked about or that talk about different things in quantum mechanics, but mostly what you're interested in is this number two here on the einstein podolsky rosen paradox, which I believe is where he introduces for the first time his um, theorem. So these first two guys, I think there's another here. This is, this is a better um, list. So even though this is even though we normally go through the contents, this list here actually has the references where they got them. So each one of these is a published paper from some position. Um, first paper is on the, pre uh, on the problem of hidden variables in quantum mechanics. That's very important. So people, especially um, Einstein, really wanted to talk about um, quantum mechanics as being incomplete and you that and because of that you'd have to add additional um, variables additional variables that you can't see to your analysis to actually understand what's going on in quantum mechanics so einstein podolsky and rosen um i'm trying to remember it wasn't einstein who was really the lead on that i don't remember if it was podolsky or rosen i think rosen um, came up with this paradox that supposedly showed that um, quantum mechanics was incomplete, that there was something a little bit off with quantum mechanics. And that's what here in Physics 1, <laughs> what a great, um, what a great place for it to be published in, right? The journal Physics, Issue 1. Page 195, but still, issue one. So here, this is what Bell does, is he tries to clarify the einstein podolsky rosen paradox into something that's a little bit, um, that's actually measurable. So he's not the first person to do that, because what he's actually doing is he's taking um, this idea from Bohm, and this isn't the uh, stuff you're thinking about from Bohm. This is... Uh, Bohm's attempt here to reformulate the einstein podolsky rosen paradox here in the, this last, maybe it's not the last chapter, but towards the end of, yeah, I think it is the last chapter. Yeah, it is the last chapter of his book on quantum mechanics, the quantum theory of the measurement process. 
And so Bohm wants to reformulate, Bohm here wants to reformulate quantum mechanics in that way, um, in a way that makes a little bit more sense to him. And it is a, it is a clearer way than Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen put it, but it's not quite clear enough. It's not quite at the point where you can turn it into a experiment. It's, you're not really comparing anything, right? The real purpose of an experiment is to compare two theories. Um, in the worst case scenario, in the worst case scenario, you're comparing a theory to if there was no theory, which isn't really very helpful. But it's possible that you could compare a theory to um, another th theory so that you actually have something real to go on, right? So um, that's what an experiment really does. So you need to formulate things in that way. And that's what uh, Bell does here, right? Is he, re he takes the Bohm reformulation of the einstein pudelsky rosen paradox and turns it into a um, contradiction here, right? And so what he's going to do is he's going to basically formulate this so that you have an inequality and that inequality if you violate this inequality then there are no classical hidden variables there are no hidden variables that are both causal and local and that's um, important the way uh, Bell formulates this is he says there are no hidden variables that are both causal and local and so what happens later on is Elena Spey and then many, many other people afterwards. We even have a um, episode on Physics Frontiers where we talk about uh, some of the uh, more recent attempts to sort of get around some of the things that are on the edges of the, pro of the problem. That We don't care too much about those edges, but um, they are sort of interesting, those edges. Uh, and we'll have a t time to talk about that later on, but once you get to the point where these things have been measured, then you have to I, you have to say, okay, well, if the quantum mechanical version is true, then I have to um, get rid of either uh, locality or causality. One of those two has to go. That's just the logical... Um, extent, that's the logical conclusion of Bell's theorem proposed here in Physics 1 in 1964. Um, and then just a few years later, uh, shown to be very prescient by Elaine Espey. Um, then he goes through the moral aspects of quantum mechanics. I didn't actually get to that one. Um, I didn't reread that one. So I I should have because now I'm completely flummoxed about what it means. Um, an introduction to the hidden variable question. We were just talking about hidden variables previously. Uh, the hypothesis that this Schrodinger equation is exact. So in general, um, people just use the Schrodinger equation, but people try other versions of the Schrodinger equation, including things like uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equations and things like that. So uh, there are additional possible Schrodinger equations out there if you want one. Uh, let's see, subject and object. Um, here we're talking about stuff like, you know, quantum mechanics has this issue, right? And so with subjects and objects, and you do have to think a little bit about this, right, when you're um, trying to interpret quantum mechanics, right? Especially when you're talking about uh, like Schrodinger's cat and things like that, or Wigner's friend, right? And, you know, that's one of the things he's talking about here, right? When does the wave packet actually collapse, right? When does that happen? Right, and, and that's what Schrodinger's cat is, but does the wave packet collapse when anybody observes it? Does the wave cat packet collapse when there's got to be an energy transfer? Does the wave cat packet collapse when a human, you know, a dog observes it? Does it have to be a human being that observes it? 
Does it have to be a particularly um, well-qualified human being that observes it with a PhD and so forth and so on? And that's sort of what um, Bell is talking about here. And that's sort of the problem with anything that has some sort of collapse in it, the wave packet uh, reduction here in the Coleman-Hepp model. Uh, there are many models for that collapse. Here um, we get to the theory of local beables. And beables are, I'm not completely sure what beables are. Actually, I did reread <laughs> re this and I'm still unclear about beables. Um, my, I think my view is wrong. My view had been previously that beables were a subset of observables. But when I'm, when I'm reading this um, theory of local beables, he's talking about like the energy and different sorts of things. There are things that have some sort of meaning, right? A beable is just something that has some sort of meaning. So maybe something that you can't measure isn't really a beable, even though you can make an operator for it in quantum mechanics. So it's a subset of operators. Maybe it is what I thought it was. It's a subset of operators that you can actually make measurements for. Right, those are the beables, and it's those other operators that don't really make any sense. Right, if you can't actually make a measurement of the thing, then it doesn't really make sense. I think that's reasonable. Locality in quantum mechanics, and this is going back to you know Bell's theorem. The whole problem with locality is that. It, things can't be local, right? You can't have perfect locality. You can't have both locality and causality. You can't have local causality. So you can only have um, non-causal. And you can only have the universe going forward in time, or you can have things only affect peop affect things that are next to each other, basically. Causality and lo locality. And Bell when he talks about this, basically says, I absolutely believe in um, causality, so locality has to go. Um, there are other people that talk about things like retro causality, and we've talked about that. And that was another thing that showed up a lot in the quantum um, time, the quantizing time conference, is something like that, uh, that also happens in some other places, like in quantum paradoxes, that book I talked about previously, there's some Rather than getting rid of the locality, people get rid of some version of the causality. So you have some sort of causal thing happening and happening from future events. How to teach special relativity? How to teach special relativity? Well, he basically, John Bell says, well, if I'm ever lucky enough to teach special relativity, I'll teach it this way. And rather than try to teach it as a big um, switch from locality switch from the past what I'd rather do is I'd rather um, try to show how much it has in common with the rest of everything right so the rest of physics so that's nice and good but it seemed to me at least at the level where I was teaching special relativity myself it puts the cart before the horse because a lot of the things that he's talking about, a lot of the ways, a lot of the things, a lot of the ways that you'd um, talk about something being um, contiguous with special relativity, being contiguous with, contiguous with previous theories of physics, are things that when you're teaching a special relativity, the students don't have a really good um, idea about. So it makes a lot of sense if you're coming through your second go through special relativity in, say, um, a graduate class or something like that. Uh, but if you're going to do this in a sophomore level class or possibly a junior level class, then probably the students don't have enough background for what um, Bell does here in this How to Teach Special Relativity. Uh, we go back to Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen experiments, uh, where he's talking about now um, what's happening with real experiments that have actually happened after um, his previous uh, explanation of them. Uh, then Bell goes on to measurement theory of Everett and de Broglie's pilot wave. In this particular, this is interesting, in this particular case, 
Um, Bell is comparing and contrasting these two, saying he likes the pilot wave better than uh, Everett's theory. Everett's theory is the multiple worlds theory. And the big problem with multiple worlds theory is that it includes this universal wave function. That's its whole point, right? The whole point of multiple worlds theory is that it has something to do with the um, universal wave function, whatever that universal wave function is. Um, the universe has to have a wave function. But whatever, it, or what Bell is saying here is that anytime you do a real experiment, what happens? Well, anytime you do a real experiment, you're sort of circumscribing the world. You're never looking at this universal wave function. You're looking at some subset of this universal wave function. So um, he's not very happy with that. But he is a little more happy, happy with de Broglie's um, pilot wave interpretation, right? And I'll be honest, again, I saw a lot of people talk about that in the um, quantizing time conference. So normally, uh, my personal feeling from um, talking to people and being um, bad-mouthed on the internet, uh, basically, my what I've heard from the, what I've looked at and from what I've heard, in general, the uh, Everett interpretation, the multiple worlds interpretation, has a better reputation among physicists than the pilot wave, the de Broglie Bohm pilot wave. Um, however, uh, we've got two other issues. We have one, the uh, The philosophers of science tend to be a little more accepting of the de Broglie um, Bohm pilot wave sort of a interpretation of quantum mechanics. And I found this out by basically getting a book called The Wave Function and reading a book called The Wave Function, <clears throat> which has a bunch of papers by a bunch of different um Philosophers, I think they were mostly philosophers. There might have been a physicist or two in there, but I think they were mostly philosophers. And it was basically talking about the de Broglie um, Bohm pilot wave solution. Also, interestingly, I saw quite a few people who were pro um, de Broglie in the quantizing time conference. I didn't really see anybody who was okay with multiple worlds. I don't remember anybody who was okay with multiple worlds. Um, other versions, I think, may have been a little more uh, um, common, a little more, uh, what should I call them? Uh, not common. Um, yeah, commonly held by people at that conference. Uh, those things like consistent histories and stuff like that, which are really, really um, specialized, so th are really mathematized, uh, math mathematical in the mathematical sense of mathematical, not mathematical in the applied sense that I'm used to, you and I are used to. So that's interesting. That's also going to be really interesting because down here we're going to talk about these again, these six possible worlds of quantum mechanics. And um, in those 10 years, Bohm's going to, or Bell is going to change his mind a lot. Free variables and local causality, more stuff about causality. Atomic cascade, photons, and quantum mechanical non-locality. Again, he's talking about actual um, experiments and his theory again. De Broglie Bohm delay choice double slit experiment and density and the density matrix. That's actually really interesting. Um, anything that has to do with the delayed choice, double slit experiment sort of stuff, like uh, Wigner, I think, put together. Um, maybe it wasn't Wigner. Uh, I really have to not go back. I, I, I did look at this. I, I don't think it's Wigner. I think it's someone else. Uh, with a W. It's really Wheeler. Okay, yeah, that's even better. Wheeler uh, came up with this idea, and that's um, a really interesting. Um, 
that's a really interesting um, thing there, where he's talk, trying to talk about uh, the deep Willie Bohm and these weird non-local correlations in these delayed choice double slit experiments where you can choose after some after something's been um, put into play, you choose the different polarizations or something. Again, if you want to talk, look at our episode on spooky ac action at a distance, these things are really, really um, these things get really, really intricate because people have to show that there's no possible way there could have been any interaction at all between anything. It's, it's just amazing how much work people go into that particular um, sort of thing. I mean, it's it's really interesting. It's interesting that anybody gives them any money to do it, <laughs> to be honest. But um, it, that's really interesting um, how much work they go into stuff like that. Uh, quantum mechanics for cosmologists. Pretty soon, um, maybe at some point I'll talk about astroparticle physics. Um, not much long after this, people are really going to get into quantum mechanics and cosmology, but it wasn't really that big up at that point. There were a few places where you needed it and some other places. Bartleman stocks and the nature of reality. Uh, this is very interesting. This is an analogy, right? This is a, um, not an analogy. What is that thing with the cave? Uh, Plato's allegory of the cave. This is an allegory for Bell's theorem. Right, with the socks of a um, particularly poorly coordinated man who, whose socks are um, generally mismatched. So that's where he's starting to talk about um, coral. He's trying to put together a good or some sort of interesting, understandable version of uh, Bell's theorem so that you know, we can understand it. The impossible pilot wave, again, we're talking about the pilot wave from uh, the De Broglie Bohm stuff, which came out after this book. So maybe a year after this book, well, De Broglie's came out in 1925. Bohm reformulated it um, in his more mathematical way um, in about 1952, a year after that quantum theory book came out. Um, Quantum field theory without observers. Again, we're getting to this point where why do we need observers in the first place? It's really important for the quantum theory of measurement previously in sort of the von Neumann um, version of quantum logic to have those observers, but the observers are a problem. They don't make a lot of sense because that's sort of saying that we're not talking about anything real in physics. Although so I saw some guy um, wrote something about that in... Um, his blog recently. Uh, I forget his name, but he's a great popularizer of physics. Um, and he was saying, yeah, we're not really talking about anything when we're talking about physics. And most physicists would disagree with you otherwise, because if they agreed with you when you said something like that, they'd be doing something else, right? They may as, you may as well write science fiction if that's what you believe. Um, speakable and unspeakable in quantum mechanics, more of this sort of stuff about pilot waves and hidden variables and things like that. Um, quantum field theory without observers, I was just there. Beables for quantum field theory, we were talking about beables. Now he's trying to go from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory. Six possible worlds of quantum mechanics. This is an interesting one because he takes what he says are six. I, I skimmed through it and um, I looked, I saw four. Um, interpretations of quantum mechanics. And if you listen to our inter quantum interpretations um, podcast, there were 10 that we went through, I think. And it all depends on how you cut them up, right? There are so many interpretations of quantum mechanics. You could slice them any way you want to. But um, the four that I recall end up in two um, categories. So one is sort of the plain vanilla quantum mechanics. This is very pragmatic. It's the shut up and calculate thing, right? It's, you know, I have a quantum mechanics textbook over here, like Securi I talked about previously. Um, and now I want to build an experiment and I want to calculate the probabilities for that experiment. And after I'm done with that, I'm not really going to worry about what my interpretation is. 
I'm just going to put things together, get an answer, and see if my ex experiment does the right thing. Okay, so that's that's one. That's pragmatic. Then you can say something sort of philosophical like that, you can, and this is sort of positivist. This is very positivist. And you'd say something like, well, with quantum mechanics, you can't say anything about the reality of the things except during the interactions, during an experiment, during an observation, between the preparation and the, um, the preparation of the experiment and the uh, measurement you can't say anything. You can't say, you know, there's an electron that had this path. You can't even say there's really an electron. There's just, you made something in one situation and you measured something in another situation and you can calculate the probabilities for those things, but everything in between you can't even say anything about. So what um, Bell says is that the difference between that pragmatic in, um, interpretation and the Copenhagen interpretation, that sort of positivist interpretation, is that you've added a little bit of romance to the pragmatic interpretation and that's how you get your Copenhagen interpretation. And now, also in the six possible worlds of quantum mechanics, Bell changes his mind about these um, Everett and de Broglie ideas. Now he says, you know, you have this pilot wave interpretation of quantum mechanics that has a universal wave function, then you have this hidden variables, or this multiple worlds, excuse me, not hidden variables, this multiple worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And they're the same thing, he says, only the multiple worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, according to Bell, is the romantic version of the de Broglie Bohm version of quantum mechanics, okay? Now, that's interesting. I, I don't think most people would agree with that, but, you know, that's the um, conclusion that Bell comes to in this paper, right? Is that multiple worlds is just a romantic version of de Broglie Bohm. Both of them have to do with a universal wave function. Um, Although there's a little extra stuff in the de Broglie Bohm thing that uh, we'd have to talk about to get an exact um, interpretation. So, and he does that for two other interpretations, but um, I don't remember what they are. Um, EPR correlations and EPW distributions. I looked at that and I've forgotten what EPW distributions are. Again, so, I'm sorry about that. Are there, con are there quantum jumps, right? Quantum jumps are something, you know, we use to start talking about quantum mechanics. We talk about them a lot in chemistry, right? In atomic and molecular physics. That, <clears throat> in optics, right? That you've got, you know, your um, electron in its lowest orbital. And then all of a sudden it's in a higher orbital, right? There's a quantum jump. It's, I don't really think it's a jump. I think, I think the um, orbitals are, you know, overlap, right, in the real world, so that you don't need a jump like that, right? You just need a change in, um, just need a change in the energy or, or the momentum, and that's going to, the energy and the momentum, and that's going to change your, um, uh, your orbital, because, you know, the orbitals aren't um, fixed circles, right? They're these probability clouds and things like that. So uh, that might be true. And I think there's a little bit that I can point to that makes that reasonable, right? I think in particular, uh, they've tried to measure the time of the tunneling between quantum states and the tunneling time between quantum states in a atom, right, between those quantum jumps that we're just talking about, seems to be zero. Or it's statistically no different from zero. Whereas, if you take something like a barrier, right, like a um, magnetic tunnel junction or something like that, you, you know, real things, things that 
showed up in hard drives. They might not be in hard drives anymore, but they at least were in hard drives when I was, you know, building hard drives. Um, there is a time delay for that kind of for that kind of tunnel junction. So tunneling times are different depending on what they are. So are there quantum jumps is talking about that, which I think you're going to hear him say no, but you know, read it to find find out. Um, against measurement, uh, this is going to be more beable stuff. And La Nouvelle Cuisine, which I completely forgot what it was. I think it has more to do with that sort of thing. So again, Speakable and Unspeakable in Quantum Mechanics, a very good book. Um, if you're really interested in quantum foundations, at some point you're going to want to pick this up, okay? Um, well, or go to the library. It will be in the library, <laughs> wherever, whatever library you have. It probably will even be in a library if you're going to a community college. Maybe not, but probably. So it's something that's likely to be around for people to read um, all over the place. It's, it's a really um, great, it's, it's a really great collection of articles and most of them you know has some math but most of them the math isn't too bad right so it's it's going to be okay they don't all have math some of them like this one free variables and local causality you can see this is basically just a logical paper he, he calls it quantum philosophy so um right where does Right, John Bell, John S. Bell papers on quantum philosophy. So, um, there you go. Uh, I like this book. I hope you um, take a peek at it and enjoy it.